morning, everyone, and welcome to our October 13th um, Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, we're very pleased this morning to have a talk entitled Sequential Com and Combined Therapies for Osteoporosis, given to us by uh, Washington University's own Roberto Citavelli. Um, but as uh, is my style, I'd like uh, the expert uh, in the room to uh, introduce Dr. Citavelli, and that would be our Division Chief for Endocrinology, Dr. Uh, Shri Matsugundam, and uh, Shri has actually been uh, a full professor at our university for a bit and division chief. He actually came originally from uh, India, graduating uh, from Mysore Medical College in 1978 and doing uh, a pre-fellowship and uh, uh, at McGill in endocrinology, followed by internal medicine here in the United States uh, and Lincoln uh, Medical and Mental Health Center. And then moving on to Montefiore um, in the Bronx, where he did an endocrinology uh, uh, fellowship on the United States side. And he has been a dedicated person in the field of endocrinology, particularly diabetes and obesity, as well as thyroid disease ever since. And it's really a pleasure to have his leadership. And I'll turn the this endocrine-related um, grand rounds with Dr. Citavelli over to Sri. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, so today we are very uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Roberto Civitelli, uh, who is currently Professor of Medicine uh, with joint appointment as Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, uh, Professor of Cell Biology and Physiology at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he's also the Division Chief of Bone and Mineral Disease in the Department of Medicine, Director of the Skeletal Disorders uh, Training Program uh, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Dr. Civitelli uh, obtained his uh, medical school training and residency in Siena, Italy. Then he came to um, Washington University, uh, St. Louis in 1985 uh, at, uh, to do his endocrinology fellowship, uh, worked with um, the very famous uh, Louis Avioli and his group, uh, very uh, well-known and uh, pioneers in the field of bone and uh, mineral uh, um, uh, research. And he has stayed there since then, uh, moving up the ranks to be a full professor. He is uh, a widely sought after speaker, both nationally and internationally. Uh, he has received numerous uh, awards, including the Fuller Albright Award for a young investigator from the uh, American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, Outstanding Faculty Mentor Award at Washington University, St. Louis, uh, Shirley Hall uh, Service Award from the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, among many others. He is um, on the editorial board of several journals, including the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, Calcified Tissue International, and he's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. He um, has been funded uh, all through uh, by um, the NIH and several other um, agencies, and currently holds four uh, NIH grants and the DOD grant. Uh, he uh, has been an expert in various aspects of bone biology. Uh, today, he will be talking to us about osteoporosis. Um, I must mention that we are one week away from the World Osteoporosis Day, which is October 20th uh, of uh, this year. Uh, so uh, we were uh, very pleased to have him present his talk on uh, the management of osteoporosis with sequential and combined therapies. Thank you, Dr. Mushka Gandhi, for the nice introduction. Uh, very thorough. Um, it makes me feel so old now. Um, but it's, uh, it's very nice to be here uh, to talk to you about osteoporosis, my favorite uh, topic, actually. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, yes, everything's good. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. reassuring. So, today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some. Um, I'm going to focus on some uh, emerging and current clinical issues and the challenges we have in our field. Uh, uh, um, some of you may have uh, encountered similar challenges, uh, but uh, for us, uh, we'll be front and center since we have a very now rather large clinical program focused on metabolic bone diseases and osteoporosis in particular. So let me just start with uh, uh, my disclosures here. And then uh, with a brief introduction to the clinical uh, problem uh, 
osteoporosis, which is a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength, predisposing a person to increase fracture. So the definition by itself also points out to bone strength more than bone density only <clears throat> as the key element for uh, uh, the uh, uh, loss of uh, um, support uh, uh, that can lead to fracture, as shown here in the sequential uh, uh, images. Uh, the fracture problem is still a major public health despite all our efforts over the past 20 years. These are old data now, but uh, they are very similar uh, today. Uh, uh, osteoporosis affects millions of people, and it's so important that uh, at age 50, the lifetime risk of fracture is one to two for women and one to five for men, meaning that one out of uh, two women will experience a fracture the fragility fracture in their lifetime. Yeah, as you can see on the pie chart, uh, most of the fractures are uh, vertebra, wrist, and hip. Those are the classic ones. But also, there is a proportion of patients who develop fractures in other sites, particularly the pelvis that's becoming uh, more relevant uh, recently for some reasons. However, it's the hip fracture that's really the big problem because uh, um, it affects uh, the uh, uh, livelihood of uh, people who suffer them. Only 24% of patients with hip fracture ever return to full uh, uh, independent life. And despite this, uh, the uh, treatment of osteoporosis is still lagging behind many of the larger, uh, more common uh, chronic disorders of aging. Only uh, really uh, a minority of uh, people with a fracture ever um, gets treated. Uh, with appropriate uh, uh, the, uh, the treatments that we know uh, function very well to decrease fracture risk. So we still have a challenge, and these are older data, but <clears throat> I can tell you that uh, the, the treatment gap, as we call it in our field, is not closing despite all our effort. So it's very important that everybody understands this and uh, has an, at least uh, uh, you know, endocrinologists or practitioners primary care physicians who uh, deal with these patients, uh, it's very important to understand that the size and the importance of the problem. So to understand osteoporosis and how uh, drugs that um, uh, prevent or uh, reverse bone loss, uh, it's, for, it's, it's crucial to understand the bone remodeling process, which is a sequence of events that occur in uh, basic multicellular units. These are small units of bone, as to, uh, schematized here, uh, where uh, bone cells do their work. Um, osteoclasts are activated first, uh, and they resorb uh, uh, a quantum, if you wish, of bone in a certain area. <clears throat> they uh, then uh, die out uh, after they're, they're done the job, leaving this uh, uh, resorption lacuna. That's where the osteoblasts then come in. Um, they proliferate, they cover the lacuna, they start manufacturing uh, the first organic matrix and then mineralize it. And then uh, they go back to a quiescent state, uh, so-called bone lining cells, uh, uh, that uh, essentially recover completely in uh, homeostatic conditions the uh, uh, resorption lacuna. So this is a small, very small macroscopic area of bone, but since there are about the millions of uh, these units operating at any single time, you can understand how uh, uh, the uh, events that uh, disrupt this uh, tightly regulated process can, leave, can, uh, can lead to a, a failure to completely re uh, re uh, refill uh, this lacuna all around the skeleton. And that's what happens with uh, um, bone loss following menopause or other conditions, for example, uh, hyperparathyroidism, where there is increased bone resorption. Uh, the excess uh, activation or resorption phase cannot be matched by the formation phase. And the uh, result is a quantum of uh, bone loss, which is then multiplied by millions uh, throughout the skeleton. And because of that, uh, the strategies for preventing or reversing this process are essentially uh, fundamentally two. One is to inhibit the, the osteoclasts. And that's what uh, most of uh, the uh, 
uh, widely used uh, 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 drug for osteoporosis uh, do. They all need a bit more resorption. Um, we also have a few options for stimulating bone formation. Uh, that's the other strategy. And then, most recently, we have one product, uh, a sclerostin inhibitor, that can be called bifunctional, in, uh, in that it does stimulate bone formation. It was, in fact, developed as an anabolic agent, but it also inhibits bone resorption. So, uh, you know, when I got into this field uh, <laughs> almost 40 years ago, I have to say, we are, we are nothing of this. We are only estrogen uh, for postmenopausal women. We've gone a long way, obviously, um, over the past three, four decades. But now we have uh, uh, we are challenged by um, uh, essentially problems related to how to use these different medications. Uh, can we use them together? Should we use them sequentially? And uh, which sequence uh, we should use? So uh, these are the, the issues I'm going to uh, focus on. And I'm going to start with a case of a patient I followed uh, uh, not long ago, but for several years now. And uh, just exemplifying the, uh, the, 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 uh, the challenge uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, this is a postmenopausal woman. I started seeing her in 2014, so it's been a while now. Uh, she came with uh, uh, ankle fractures after trauma, uh, the history of ankle fractures, but in the early 30s, but no fractures since then. Uh, she had hysterectomy at age 30, but uh, only uh, the uterus was removed. The menopause was probably approximately around 50, very average, never taken uh, hormone replacement therapy. She had been earlier <coughs> diagnosed with osteoporosis earlier on by QCT which is a technique we don't use anymore. Uh, uh, although <clears throat> it was more uh, uh, common years ago. Uh, nonetheless, based on that measurement, she was started on Fosamax, which she took for about 10 years until the year before the visit. And the primary care uh, physician was concerned about uh, the recent decline in bone density despite uh, the treatment. And uh, the classical uh, question that we receive from <coughs> referrals uh, like this, what do we do next after 10 years of Pozzoman? So a brief uh, additional historical detail. She's a, a smoker, but not uh, heavy. She's physically active. Um, there is a family history of osteoporosis in the mother and two aunts. Um, not really physically uh, remarkable. She has been taking vitamin D, 2,000 units per day. No other medications that would uh, be really relevant. Uh, calcium, vitamin D, PTH were all normal. A little bit increase of uh, alkaline phosphatase, but also liver function tests. And it turns out she has some degree of uh, fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So that's uh, uh, her baseline. And as I mentioned, this QCT T score is in the osteoporosis range with apparently a slight decline between 2012 and 2014. Although, again, the T scores by the QCT are not <clears throat> the same, do not have the same uh, meaning as the DEXA uh, T scores. So, what should we do? Should we restart the native medication? Anybody? Uh, wants to, uh, let's see if I can look at the chart. So I think uh, we should restart an active medication, even if it should be known for uh, five, uh, for 10 years, um, <clears throat> because she remains osteoporotic. And uh, there is also evidence, which I think is clinically relevant of uh, <clears throat> Uh, worsening of uh, bone density. So uh, the bone loss itself is concerning. And then the question is, which medication should we use? Should we go again for an antiresorptive or an anabolic agent, considering that she's been on uh, these for uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, 10 years already? <clears throat> 
My preference uh, went for an anabolic agent because of the very low bone mass and previous exposure to our bisphosphonates. <clears throat> but of course, uh, uh, another more potent uh, antiresorptive would be uh, appropriate, uh, like the nosumab. <clears throat> So we started on teriparatide in May 2014, and these are the results. As you can see, the patient still has osteoporosis, uh, and she experienced a little bump in bone density of the spine, but not as uh, much as uh, I would have hoped. <clears throat> and this is probably because of the previous exposure to alendronate for a long, long time. It takes a while for bone turnover to reactivate. No changes to the proximal femur, as uh, you would expect. So after uh, these two years on teriparatide, we switched her to uh, uh, denosuma. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, she started uh, gaining bone uh, even at a faster rate. Now she's in the osteopenia range. But uh, after three years, there was no further gains, at least at the spine. So the question is, uh, what uh, do we do uh, next after this sequence? <clears throat> and uh, bone gains were also observed at the proximal femur, which is actually not usual. Um, but this already uh, gives you an idea of uh, the of results that can be obtained by this sequential treatment, uh, an anabolic followed by an antiresortive. Thing particular teriparatide followed by the nosumab. So we go back to uh, the last two years after, uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and again, I wanted to you know, point out about uh, the challenges uh, that we are now facing for long-term therapy. Uh, of course, uh, there are concerns with continuous use of bisphosphonate beyond five, six years. As you know, people are afraid of uh, very rare, but uh, severe side effects like uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw or uh, atypical femoral fractures. So those are very, very uh, rare. Um, uh, anabolic agents can be given only for one to two years, including the new one, uh, romosalzolab. So how do we use them in the context of a longer term uh, uh, treatment plan? There are uncertainties about the modalities and effectiveness of sequential or uh, uh, combined therapeutic regimens. And also the major issue that we're facing is that uh, it's pretty clear that bone gains reverse after this continuation of therapy for most of these medications. That doesn't happen with uh, the uh, bisphosphonate though. Uh, so that's uh, uh, this, the, the problem of uh, what to do after we discontinue medications uh, has um, gain momentum um, uh, after we uh, started using other, the more, the newer medications, so to speak. Uh, we didn't happen with Sosomet, as shown here, uh, data from the old uh, um, uh, phase three trial when we use bisphosphonate daily. Uh, you know, discontinued the medication uh, is not followed by any uh, rebound or bone loss. Uh, patients uh, continue to, they don't gain any more bone density, but they stay uh, stable. Um, and this is probably because um, bisphosphonates uh, do not, uh, 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 after uh, the uh, withdrawal of bisphosphonate in patients, bone turnover markers do not go above baseline. Uh, this is uh, these are data from residual uh, again from uh, the uh, pivotal phase three trial, and just to you know, make a long story short, uh, after seven years, all the subjects who continued this extension study were released, were uh, discontinued, and the bone turnover markers did increase a little bit, but still remained forty percent below baseline. And this is probably because of the peculiar mechanism of action of these phosphates, which as you may know, uh, uh, they uh, attach very avidly to uh, uh, bone, the bone surfaces, especially those undergoing active remodeling. Um, uh, and they stay there, they're actually in part incorporated as part of the bone matrix. And they are released um, through osteoclastic bone resorption. 
Um, and uh, when they're released, uh, they inhibit osteoclasts and create the cause of osteoporosis, and therefore allow uh, osteoblasts to uh, come in and uh, do their work. So because the bisphosphonate can remain within the bone matrix embedded inside the matrix for many years, uh, there probably this is the reason for the continued effectiveness and for uh, uh, our ability to give them uh, over very long intervals, you know, once uh, a month for the orals and once a year for zoledronic acid. The uh, action of other uh, resorption inhibitors, and particularly rank ligand inhibitors such as denosumab, is very different. So, rank uh, denosumab is a, uh, an antibody that uh, takes away rank ligand which is a, a key cytokine produced by uh, stromal cells and osteoblasts that is absolutely necessary for osteoblasts to develop and function. So denosumab uh, mimics the effect of another uh, important cytokine also produced by osteoblasts and osteocytes, which is called OPG, osteoprotegerin. Um, and normal remodeling, the, the uh, Secretion of rank ligand, an activator of osteoblasts, an OPG, an inhibitor, is very well orchestrated in a time wise fashion by the uh, stromal component of the bone marrow. Uh, and the nosomal interferes with the process, essentially, prevents almost completely any osteoblast activation. However, <clears throat> once uh, you release that uh, inhibition, things return to baseline and with a vengeance. So if you look at uh, the uh, changes in bone tumor markers here, I'm showing you uh, 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 CTX, which is a marker of uh, collagen breakdown, uh, Cetaminus uh, telopeptide of collagen, uh, and the P1MP, which is a marker of bone formation. These are uh, products released during collagen maturation and therefore uh, bone formation. You can see both, uh, 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 jump back up above baseline uh, once uh, the uh, medication is withdrawn. And this, unfortunately, is not just a uh, bone turnover uh, change. This re is reflected by an unfortunate increase in fracture rates. <clears throat> uh, these are data from uh, the uh, phase two trial, which was continued for a uh, further two or three years. Um, uh, some patients continued on uh, denosumab, others uh, went uh, off treatment, and you can see the patient who went, went off treatment after three years of denosumab uh, experienced an increase in fracture risk comparable to the baseline. So this is actually pretty concerning and uh, you know, poses a big challenge. We cannot uh, leave patients off denosumab without doing anything else because they will start refracturing. And unfortunately, we have evidence for that in our own clinic. This phenomenon um, is not uh, only exclusive of uh, denosumab. We have actually seen it for other <coughs> reversible inhibitors of bone resorption. Uh, and by reversible, I mean uh, uh, that once the uh, product is discontinued, bone turnover is released uh, to uh, rebalance. Uh, not like bisphosphonate, which are embedded in the matrix and therefore the skeleton serves as a sort of a natural reservoir for continuous uh, release. These are data from the Odanakatib uh, trial. Odanakatib, for those who are not uh, familiar, uh, is a catepsin K inhibitor, which was developed uh, for, uh, as a therapy for osteoporosis. And unfortunately, it never made it to market because of other reasons, you know, side effects and also the need of uh, twice a day uh, uh, administration. But the type of trial was completed uh, correctly. And as you can see here, bone density increases, it kept increasing even beyond uh, the two years uh, of uh, the, the study uh, duration. But uh, in those patients who had taken the medication and then stopped, bone density fell down to baseline very quickly. Uh, and this was associated with a sharp increase in uh, bone uh, resorption markers. So this rebound phenomenon is not uncommon and it's uh, probably related to the biology, uh, to the altered biology uh, caused by these medications. So there are a couple of potential mechanisms, I'm just gonna go over 
for this uh, pretty fast. Um, but it's important to understand uh, at least the basics of uh, what might be going on at the cellular level. So one hypothesis that's been kind of proven uh, for uh, 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 inhibitors such as uh, uh, odonacatib, uh, during treatment, there is a buildup of osteoclast precursors because these inhibitors don't really kill the osteoclasts, but they rather simply inhibit their function. They become, uh, so to speak, constipated osteoclasts. Uh, they are there, they get big, but uh, they, are, they cannot secrete uh, uh, the, uh, all the uh, component of uh, the resorption lacuna, particularly uh, uh, catepsin K, essentially, an enzyme that's key for removal of the bone matrix. But once uh, the inhib inhibitory uh, break is uh, released, this built up of osteoclast precursor now uh, all, all of a sudden very rapidly become active osteoclast and they overwhelm the osteoclast. Another mechanism may be a more subtle uh, that may be at play, for example, with the nosumab. And that's probably related to the loss of uh, osteoblasts and early osteocytes uh, by the prolonged suppression of bone uh, resorption, the bone turnover. Um, in uh, subjects uh, uh, who have uh, been on uh, the nosumab for many uh, months and uh, years, uh, bone biopsies show that uh, there is an absence of osteoclasts, but there is also a loss of. Uh, uh, bone forming cells so simply because the two processes are so well coupled. And in the early phases of uh, the rebound, what may happen is that these uh, late osteoblasts and osteocytes, the producer of OPG, the inhibitor, um, <clears throat> are actually absent. So the situation is that uh, uh, rank ligand, which is produced by bone marrow precursors, um, uh, can uh, really work. Uh, um, uh, without uh, a restraint, um, and uh, the result is uh, in further an abnormal activation of osteoblasts without any break. So, <clears throat> in this case, uh, I think the importance of this is that uh, uh, if this is the case, <clears throat> it really sets the stage for uh, uh, the use of uh, um, <clears throat> anabolic agents actually after. Uh, this continuation of the nosma, because if we, uh, uh, if this is the case, the sooner <clears throat> and, the, and the better we restore the bone formation component, uh, the better for uh, the overall uh, tumor. <clears throat> so, can we use electronic acid after the nosma to prevent this rebound? Of course, this is something, this is what we've been doing, uh, most people. <clears throat> uh, um, you know, uh, most of uh, uh, clinicians and also researchers working in this area. Since there is such a spike in bone resorption after discontinuation, why don't we just stop that and then we resolve the problem? Well, unfortunately, it's not as simple as it sounds. So showing here is a study that was published a couple of years ago <clears throat> by a Danish group uh, who uh, uh, randomly allocated uh, patients coming off uh, the nosumab to uh, three groups. Uh, one group was treated with, was given one infusion of zoledronic acid at six months after the last uh, uh, shot of uh, the nosumab. Another group was uh, infused uh, nine months after, at the time when it's believed that uh, the peak of uh, the rebound occurs. And one group was left uh, without any treatment. Uh, so as you can see here, looking at uh, CTX, again, a macro bone resorption, um, the uh, changes are what you would expect. So patients who uh, were dosed uh, uh, at the beginning of the observation period, that is six months after the last denosumab dose, experienced a drop in uh, bone uh, resorption. But then bone resorption, uh, again, rebounded uh, to adjustable baseline levels. Those who were those at nine months as we the same. Uh, but at the end of uh, the day, at the end of one year, one year and a half, uh, no matter what uh, these patients received, uh, they all uh, rebalanced towards uh, relatively high levels of uh, CTX, <clears throat> similar to the observation group. And following bone density, um, 
uh, every uh, three, six months in this group of patients show that regardless of uh, whether you give zoledronic acid actually, uh, you end up with the same degree of bone density, which is about 5% lower than baseline. Yes, there may be some advantage of uh, dosing uh, earlier because this bone loss is uh, uh, slowed down, but uh, it is not prevented, unfortunately. And that's the same for hip bone density. So these are pretty you know, disappointing results, uh, especially for uh, the idea of using zoledronic acid for preventing the uh, rebound. <clears throat> so what happened to our patient? Uh, so yeah, we dosed it with zoledronic acid after the last nosumab uh, uh, injection about nine months and one year later, big bone loss, unfortunately. And despite the second dose, uh, no recovery. So the patient is almost back to where it was before the uh, uh, sequential treatment. Same at the proximal femur. Luckily, she's still in those opinion range, but as you can see here, she completely lost all uh, the bone gains. Very disappointing, very disappointing. But you know, there are different ways we can do this now that we have learned our lessons. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are more studies that have emerged over the past couple of years on this topic, because as, as you can imagine, it's really very front and center of what we are doing. This is a real world study that was presented at SBMR uh, last month and just published in Bourne uh, from Switzerland, uh, where they looked at the changes in um, bone density after discontinuation of the nosoma in the patients who were prescribed the medication by their physicians. So it's a real world study, it's not a clinical trial. But it's good because it gives a snapshot of what happens in uh, real life, essentially. So the bottom line is that, uh, and you know, this is uh, uh, negative changes, okay? This is a very counterintuitive way of uh, showing data. Usually negative changes are shown from zero below. Uh, so bear with me. So these are negative changes. Uh, so uh, at the different uh, uh, sites, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the negative changes are highest when uh, the nosomab was given for longer, okay? These patients received 10, <clears throat> 10 uh, or 15 doses of the nosomab, and they lost bone more than those who were dosed only for five uh, doses. <clears throat> uh, and even after one dose of zoledronic acid, given six months after the nosomab, the bone uh, uh, density uh, lo was lost. In this case, uh, now the changes from baseline are positive. Uh, this shows uh, the gains that were obtained uh, using the three different uh, uh, regimens, or let's say three different uh, durations, uh, you know, showing nicely uh, that uh, the longer you uh, treat, the higher bone density you achieve. But then if you discontinue, uh, the longer you treat, the larger uh, negative changes you see. So the total bone density uh, at the end of uh, one year after zoledronic acid is far lower than uh, when we stopped the nosoma. Although it, in this case, it is still a good uh, positive change. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, the nosoma is efficacious up to 10 years, uh, at least uh, from what uh, we see from clinical trials. So it's, uh, it's also safe. So we really have a long window of time. We don't have really to uh, rush into uh, discontinuing something that uh, works for so well and so safely. Um, but, you know, we will have to discontinue uh, the medication at some point. Uh, and, uh, you know, patients on the nosomab should strictly adhere to the treatment regimen every six months. And patients to discontinue the nosomab should be rapidly transitioned to alternative resorptive agents. So the question is, you know, which anti-resorptive agent? Um, other bisphosphonates may be better than zoledronic acid. There are data, you know, there's still the primary data suggesting that perhaps, perhaps uh, the old weekly alendronate may be in fact better in preserving the um, bone uh, density after the nosomal of discontinuation. <clears throat> uh, uh, but uh, um, yeah, we need to know more about it. 
another question is whether we uh, can use uh, Romosozoma uh, because simply because uh, it would uh, stimulate uh, bone formation in addition to inhibit uh, bone resorption. And uh, uh, in a situation that uh, the nosoma uh, creates after um, months or years of treatment, uh, it, uh, uh, in theory, it could be uh, a very useful uh, uh, option. <clears throat> so, um, just to you know to broaden uh, the concept, uh, the uh, this concept of uh, reversal of bone gains after discontinuation medication is certainly not new to us. Uh, we knew that this happens also after PTH analog discontinuation from earlier on. This uh, 2005 study, uh, highly quoted, uh, very important at the time, which uh, looked at the effectiveness of uh, uh, PTH one to eighty four, okay? not teriparatide one to eighty four which is not used in the US, although it is uh, uh, registered in other countries, um, showing that you know, 12 months of treatment uh, nicely increase uh, bone density. <clears throat> but then uh, uh, when uh, uh, patients were uh, uh, taken off the medication, the, the, the uh, uh, red squares, <clears throat> bone density uh, reverses essentially. It doesn't go down to back uh, baseline, but uh, uh, patients lose bone density. <clears throat> and that's the reason why, and, uh, of course, this, this change can be completely reversed by switching patients to a lander name. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is the reason why uh, we have been used to uh, uh, treat patients with uh, uh, teriparatide or are now abloparatide and then switch them to an anti resorption inhibitor immediately after. The treatment uh, phase. <clears throat> so one question is uh, that you know ha has been uh, uh, pursued is uh, about uh, um, how we can use anabolics and resorption inhibitors in a way that uh, would allow us to expand the so-called anabolic window. <clears throat> As for anabolic window, I intend uh, the uh, the time within which there is a an asynchrony between uh, the increase in bone formation here schematized as uh, the changes in bone formation markers and the increase in bone resorption which always follows uh, activation of uh, osteo, uh, um, uh, osteoblasts um, <clears throat> and this is what happens with pth after a few months bone resorption uh, increases uh, and uh, uh, at the end of uh, two or three years, uh, the two uh, arms of the remodeling uh, uh, process recouple and no further anabolic effect is seen. So if that's the case, why don't we then add uh, an anti-resorptive agent and a combined treatment in the hope that uh, this will uh, slow down the rise in uh, resorption and therefore widen the anabolic window. So this concept was uh, Tested in the PATH trial that I've shown you before, and it didn't really give us uh, good results. But later on, it has been, uh, let's say, modernized <clears throat> uh, by primarily the work of uh, Ben Leader at uh, MGH, uh, who has published a few seminal papers on this uh, combined versus sequential regimens. So he enrolled uh, 94 postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, and uh, I located uh, them to uh, one of three arms. Uh, one was uh, teriparatide followed for two years, followed by two years of denosumab, one with the reversal uh, cycle, and one with the combination of the two. So you can see the combination, the green uh, curve here, is probably the best, uh, especially during the first uh, 24 uh, months. Uh, you know, proving the concept that uh, it is stimulating bone formation while inhibiting bone resorption at the same time yields the best results. However, you can see that uh, the sequential treatment, teriparatide and osoma, at the end of the, the four years, uh, ends up ha having the same effect. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, not so much in the radius, but certainly in the spine. And what's a little bit concerning is this uh, 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 decrease, uh, acute decrease in uh, bone density when patients were switched from denosumab to teriparatide. Okay. 
At the end, you know, the, the gains uh, were uh, a little lower, but similar to uh, the two uh, the other two regimens. But clearly, one can argue that uh, the sequential treatment, teriparatatidinosumab, probably yields the same effects without having to burden patients with two uh, uh, medications that are pretty heavy to take. And the same results of the femoral neck and total hip. So in, uh, in which uh, case though, the uh, uh, reversal uh, uh, sequence was not as good. <clears throat> this was paralleled by the expected changes in, uh, uh, in uh, the chemical markers of uh, bone turnover with, uh, again, the, uh, the nosma to teriparatide combination ending up with uh, increased uh, bone turnover which at this point will, uh, you know, will have to be addressed by itself with another uh, medication. <clears throat> so the concept of expanded anabolic window, we can actually uh, see uh, it's possible. And uh, at least the combination with an anabolic agent, the PTH uh, receptor activator with uh, rank ligand inhibitor works very well. But now with the antiscleroscin antibodies, we have uh, the same, uh, uh, we can achieve the same essentially with a single uh, uh, agent uh, because uh, uh, antiscleroscin antibodies uh, uh, do both. They increase bone uh, formation and also decrease bone resorption, albeit to a smaller extent. So the anabolic window for sclerosis antibody is actually in theory much wider than for PTH analogs. And in fact, uh, this is proven by uh, bone density and bone turnover results of uh, the uh, phase three, of the phase two and three trials of Romosozumab. <clears throat> yeah, this is the first study uh, showing the changes in uh, bone density. Uh, this is a well-designed study because it had uh, uh, placebo, but also a positive, I mean, a, two positive uh, controls uh, with two totally different mechanisms of action. Uh, so, as you can see, the uh, uh, group treated with romosozumab gained a really large uh, amount of bone after one year compared to even teriparatide. Uh, and the same uh, is seen also in the femoral neck, which is a, a, a total hip which typically is not a very uh, good responder to uh, any treatment we have. Uh, <clears throat> the changes in bone turnover marker uh, are uh, now uh, well known, but at uh, the time this study uh, was uh, uh, published, it was a little bit surprising because we thought, you know, activating bone formation was something that uh, could go on for a while, uh, but instead it doesn't, uh, you know, the, the, uh, starting treatment with uh, romosozumab does increase bone formation immediately, immediately, almost a twofold increase. But then, as you can see, after three or uh, four months, uh, this change starts uh, to wane. And then at 12 months, bone formation is back even below baseline. Uh, mirror changes in uh, bone tumor markers, uh, bone remodeling, sorry, in, in bone resorption. Uh, are also seen with an immediate decrease in uh, bone resorption and then a similar recovery with uh, realignment of uh, both formation and resorption uh, towards lower level. Whereas with teriparatide, bone formation and resorption stay high throughout treatment and with uh, alindronate, they stay low. So it's a different uh, type of biology that we are interfering with, with uh, uh, removal of sclerostin. But it's something that's very useful because within this year, patients really gain bone mass. Uh, and also, uh, it's reflected by even a better effect on fracture risk. Okay, so this was a head to head study between uh, uh, alendronate and romsozumab, and then switching to alendronate uh, everybody uh, after one year. As you can see, there is a, a significant uh, difference in the risk ratio. Uh, in terms of uh, new vertebral fractures between Romo and Alindronate. And this difference actually persists uh, even after one year after everybody had uh, taken Alindronate. So this sequence here, Romo's Ultima and Alindronate, seems to be another one that could be very useful 
for uh, reducing fracture risk. <clears throat> Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, it, it, we uh, we could not anticipate, but uh, uh, the reality is that uh, rebound of bone turnover and reversal of bone gains happens with uh, lomosolzumab as well. Uh, so this is a phase two trial um, where they use the different combinations of sequential treatments, but. Uh, just for the sake of uh, this presentation, I just want to show you the changes in lumbar spine in a different group of patients. Those who uh, were uh, uh, transitioned from romosozumab to denosumab, they continue to increase. Okay. <clears throat> Those who uh, were uh, switched to placebo uh, from romo, they lost within one year, almost like uh, denosumab. Uh, though they didn't go below baseline. And those who uh, uh, started the uh, uh, alentimate, al then uh, went on romosozumab, and then went on placebo, also started losing pain. So uh, even with this uh, reversible biphasic, by bi functional uh, uh, product, uh, we need to be careful and plan discontinuation well. These are the changes in bone turnover markers uh, following those uh, same patients. You can see here <clears throat> those patients who were those with uh, uh, ramosozumab uh, in terms of uh, bone resorption, yes, experienced a decrease, you know, decrease, and then uh, the return to baseline, the slower decrease, but then reactivation after discontinuation. <clears throat> a couple of uh, uh, trials have uh, shown that this, however, can be prevented very nicely simply by using an oral uh, 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 bisphosphonate, other, in this case, uh, uh, imandronate, and alendronate works uh, just well. Okay, so once you have put uh, your patients on homosozumab for 12 years and obtained more than 10% increase of bone density in the number spine, you can switch them to abandonate uh, and uh, uh, they stay, uh, or you can switch them to denosumab. And they actually may further gain. But then here, after two years, you have the problem of uh, what to do after this continuation of denosumab. So you need to think about what's the best for the patient. <clears throat> uh, likewise, uh, treatment with this phosphonate of denosumab can. Uh, uh, Compensate and actually hypercompensate uh, the potential rebound with the decrease of uh, markers. And finally, this is my last two slides. I just want to uh, show you uh, this uh, recently published study, which I think you know, drives home the message of uh, uh, the type of sequence. The type of sequence does affect outcome. <clears throat> and this is important from a clinic for clinical application. <clears throat> so this uh, group of investigators, Felicia Kozman from uh, uh, New York, they uh, collected data from different trials that used romosozumab with other uh, products, either denosumab or alendronate, and ask uh, what uh, happens to uh, changes in bone density uh, uh, for the first year with romosozumab, and then cumulative two years after sequential treatment. So as you can see here, uh, in two different studies, uh, subjects with osteoporosis gain pretty much the same amount of bone density of the spine. Uh, so this is a validation essentially to different cohorts. <clears throat> but if subjects had previously been exposed to lindronate, uh, then uh, the gain in bone density was not as large. Although a pretty healthy, almost 10% gain. I'll certainly take that, uh, but a little bit lower than would be expected from naive patients. And uh, if patients have been exposed to denosoma before, well, the gain is actually even lower, substantially lower. So, you know, the type of sequence matters. It's better to start romosozumab before, I mean, uh, before uh, uh, denosoma than vice versa. Uh, similar to what uh, we've seen before with the uh, 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 sequence using teriparatide and denosumab. 
And after two years, those uh, subjects who uh, had been exposed to the nosumab, yes, started to gain bone density even more, uh, but uh, uh, not as much as those uh, who had been exposed to uh, alentronate before or to nothing before. So who had been uh, as, uh, uh, treated with the reversal uh, regimen, almost also after the nosumab. So treatment sequence counts. Okay, uh, this is the same result of that uh, hip of one method. <clears throat> so, I mean, in closing, I just want to uh, uh, underscore that uh, uh, even with Romus Otsuma, it represents uh, really a change in the way we uh, uh, think about uh, uh, treatment for osteoporosis. We can expect uh, that. Uh, uh, after this continuation, things will return to baseline slowly. So, uh, patient to discontinue romosolzumab should be rapidly transitioned to an anti-resorptive agent, and this can be simply an oral bisphosphonate or the nosumab, although further rebound may be possible. So, treatment sequence is important, and this is really the last uh, 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 piece of information I want to leave you with. Uh, the best sequence is an anabolic agent for one to two years, followed by an anti-resorptive agent for uh, achieving the largest gains in bone density. In general, previous exposure to an anti-resorptive agent reduces, although it does not prevent, uh, the effect of an anabolic agent on bone density, uh, and this applies to all uh, uh, anabolic agents. Combined anabolic and anti-resorptive therapy may yield uh, the highest bone gains, but the advantages over the sequential treatment arrangements are not clear. And in fact, you know, even practically, it will be almost impossible to, to implement considering you know, the cost and the uh, uh, difficulty in uh, um, uh, keeping patients on uh, two types of injectables or an injectable uh, and uh, oral agent. So this is uh, all I want to share with you. Thank you for bearing with me. Today's event code is this one here, uh, and I'll be glad to uh, take any questions. We have a few minutes left, so. All right, Dr. Civitelli, thank you for such a wonderful uh, presentation today. Um, um, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, Doctor, um, you can you can unmute and ask, or if you want to post it in the chat area. But uh, I'll let the Doctor Moksha Gundam uh, kind of kick us off here. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Civitelli, for summarizing uh, the um, latest approaches to management of osteoporosis. So uh, certainly, one of the problems that we have, you mentioned that um, you know. Only 22% of people who are fractured ever get started on treatment. Uh, one of the problems we face is continuation of treatment, you know, because you, know, you showed uh, the data so well that um, if you stop the treatment, and particularly so with denosumab, um, you know, people are always uh, interested, when can I stop this treatment? When do I stop? You know? so, yeah. it, and, and that seems to be a, a big issue for us. Um, so, you know, how do we approach that uh, continuing uh, treatment? Yeah, so that's really the, 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 the big issue. I, I tried, you know, to give you an idea of uh, what may be done <clears throat> based on the recent... I have to say, last year uh, in particular has been very prolific in terms of new studies, new experiences, new data have been shared, uh, published. So we're starting to learn uh, a little bit more. So, you know, I think I was... Uh, Comforted a bit uh, by uh, uh, results using simply oral uh, uh, bisphosphonates uh, for uh, preventing the, the nosumab discontinuation rebound. Uh, I want to see you know, stronger data, but that seems to be really a potential option. Uh, so, and really, uh, in some patients who continue to fracture or still have uh, severe osteoporosis, I think a consideration to romosozumab can be given. I see a couple of questions on the chat here. Uh, mm -hmm. So one is uh, about uh, any advances in preventing onset of osteoporosis in those who are genetically predisposed to the onset. Very, very good question. 
In fact, uh, the idea of early onset osteoporosis is gaining momentum in our field with the uh, new discoveries, you know, and also uh, uh, you know, more uh, widespread and cheaper <clears throat> genetic testing that we have, we are discovering a lot of uh, potential um, genetically uh, based uh, uh, cases of uh, low bone density, which you know, uh, kind of blur uh, you know, the field between uh, osteoporosis and osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, so uh, it, it's, that's really uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, front lines of research right now. Uh, so uh, right now, we really I cannot give you any specific recommendations on which medications may work uh, best in those patients. Although uh, in early onset osteoporosis in, in uh, people with low bone density starting uh, at early uh, at an early age, I think you know we can certainly uh, uh, you know leverage uh, the uh, anabolic agents at least for uh, uh, initially. Uh, to bring up bone density to the full potential of their genetic background. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that, uh, yes, uh, the anabolic agents are all, uh, uh, can be given for a short time, although the uh, two-year limitation of teriparatide has been lifted, but they're still, uh, uh, they still work best if they're given for no more than two years. Uh, there is nothing against repeating the cycle uh, later on. Okay, just like uh, Romos Ozuman, it's uh, given for one year, but uh, uh, one year at a time. There is nothing against repeating the one year, let's say five years later. So, sort of, you can use these cycles to slowly build up uh, bone density. So, and the other question was uh, would you prefer Romos Ozuman over teriparatide or abaloparatide for starting sequential therapy? Well, it depends. Um, you know, with the, with the, uh, PTH receptor agonist, uh, Terry or Rabaloparatide, <clears throat> you can probably, uh, since you can give them for two years, uh, they may um, end up in two years with uh, larger gains of bone density. Uh, so you may think about, you know, how much, uh, uh, how severe the, uh, uh, the uh, osteoporosis is. Um, but you know, uh, it's very hard to say because uh, uh, Ramosozuma works so well and it's so powerful uh, that uh, it could be really becoming the uh, therapy of choice for anabolic agents. It's also easier to give because it's uh, an injection, actually two injections uh, once a month uh, compared to uh, a daily you know, subcutaneous uh, stick. So it does go better uh, with, with patients. The question is whether there are any established guidelines for physical exercise uh, to prevent and treat osteoporosis in men uh, and women. Um, well, there are some guidelines, yes. Uh, not really very strict, but there are some guidelines. We know that uh, uh, weight-bearing exercise is very good. It's actually what we recommend uh, uh, for everybody as part of our uh, approach to young bone health. Uh, good lifestyle, you know, correction of bad habits, uh, start being active, and if uh, 30 minutes walking or uh, weight-bearing activity at least three or four times a week, but more is better. Um, the, the point is that you cannot completely prevent bone loss, unfortunately, with just uh, you know, diet and physical uh, uh, lifestyle changes. Unfortunately, in many cases, that's not enough. Uh, so I have this conversation with many of my patients, of course, you know, it would be great if we could do everything without resorting to, you know, to, uh, to pharmacologic agents, but unfortunately we cannot. And that's why we have these tools now. Uh, but uh, there are some loose guidelines for physical therapy, although again, we cannot really prevent bone loss completely. Uh, and that is good for men and women, by the way, it's, it applies to both, uh, uh, both uh, genders. All right, we got maybe a minute or two. Uh, if any, any more questions, or uh, you can post it real quick in the chat area. If you want to unmute and ask, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that as well. So, do you have any uh, concerns about uh, the denosumab in uh, immune compromised individuals? 
No, I don't. Uh, I know that there was a concern that was raised uh, earlier on uh, during development of uh, the uh, anti rank legal antibody simply because uh, rank legal is also present as, as produced by some uh, subsets of the T lymphocytes. And that was, uh, you know, uh, raises concern. But, you know, so the, the uh, safety data from clinical trials uh, gave no signal. Uh, there is no, uh, I mean, of, uh, of uh, any uh, interference with the immune system or immune responses. There is no evidence of uh, even post marketing that uh, patients who are more uh, not immunocompromised, but uh, uh, that uh, are uh, you know, uh, treated with the, um, medication that suppress uh, immune function. Even, Patients on corticosteroids, for example, and uh, on uh, immunosuppressive agents. There is no evidence that uh, the nose uh, uh, you know, uh, has negative uh, uh, effects there. So I, I'm not concerned about that, no. Thanks. Jason, you're muted. Yeah, I just noticed that. Yeah. Uh, we're about a minute or two past nine. So I know uh, Dr. Civitelli has a couple of uh, some appointments he has here in a minute, in a few minutes with our uh, with the, our endocrinology uh, faculty and folks. So um, um, do you want me to make the presentation, Dr. Moksha Gundam, or do you want to go ahead and mention it? Or Okay, well, the, Dr. Civitelli, again, thank you for outstanding presentation and We've, we have a tradition in the U of L Department of Medicine that we have a little gift for our visiting professors, our visiting speakers, even though we're even though you're even though you're in St. Louis right now. Yes. But uh, uh, we like to present every present you guys with um, something that is synonymous with Louisville. So in a few several in a few days, you will be getting your very own personalized Louisville Slugger bat. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'm glad not to have to take that through the airport security. Uh, no, yeah, we, we have we'll, even yeah we had to even in the even in, in even during in person grand rounds yeah we should, we'd have to ship it to you. <laughs> but uh, UPS will be bringing that to you here in, in a few days. So I just want to thank. That's great, you. thank you. No problem, thank you. And Dr. Moshe Gunnam, any last words before we close out here? Uh, thank you very much. I think it was a very wonderful talk. Uh, really. Uh, you know, helping uh, clinicians to you know, plan how they're going to uh, address this very important problem. It's always uh, uh, a pleasure to listen to Dr. Civitelli. Excellent, excellent. Thank you.